I know I saw a couple people registered when I looked earlier today. Oh, here we go. As we've got some people coming in, welcome so much to this month's Science on Tap event. We'll, uh, we'll wait a few minutes to see if any more people come in and then we can get started. State University. And we also have Diane Lerman, who is an environmental health program manager, also with the Pennsylvania Integrated Pest Management Program here at Penn State. So they're going to talk to us today about a couple different types of urban pests that are really common in Pennsylvania, as well as integrated pest management techniques, what that is, what it does, and how to use it against these pests. Um, but before we do that, we're going to do a little bit of trivia. All right. Awesome, thanks, Sierra. Make sure I can start the polls here. Okay, so poll number one. Bed bugs are not only itchy and stressful, they also can transmit diseases. Is this true or false? All right, we have a small, uh, number of attendees today. So the results are already in. And that is uh, the results said true. However, the real answer is false. So they haven't been uh, shown to transmit diseases outside of a laboratory as of yet, which is great news. Even though they're terrible creatures, at least they're not transmitting diseases um, in a public health setting. All right. So now second. Okay. Next question. How far can a flea jump? A, two inches. B, six inches. C, 13 inches. Or D, there's no way to tell. They're too fast. All right. Results are in for 13 inches and you would be correct. And that's roughly 200 times a flea's body length. So it's really wild how far that they can jump. All right, and we have one more. Okay, last question. How many species of cockroaches are most commonly found in Pennsylvania? A, one, B, three, C, 10, or D, 13? All right, results are in and you are correct. It's three, so there's three common species that are found in Pennsylvania. These are the American, Oriental and German cockroach. However, there's two other species that are just occasional pests and um, uncommonly found, but are in Pennsylvania occasionally. And those are the brown banded and the Pennsylvania wood cockroach. All right, that's it for our trivia. So at this point, we're gonna turn it over to Michelle and Dion and they're gonna 
tell us all about some common urban pests in Pennsylvania and how to manage those pests. All right. All right. So let me pull this up and make sure you are seeing what you're supposed to be seeing. Nope. <laughs> you're not. <laughs> well, let me try that again. I forgot to mention, as usual, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A pod. Um, and if you just have general comments, go ahead and put those in the chat. All right, let me try something else. It worked when we were practicing and now it's not working. <laughs> That's the way That's it, goes. it goes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Are you seeing it? Or no? Yeah, but you're not in present. There you go. Okay, got it. Perfect. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone. My name is Michelle Niedermeyer, as Hannah said, and um, I'm going to kick us off with just a general overview about integrated pest management. And then um, my partner in crime, Dion, is going to launch into a little more detail um, specifically about bed bugs. Um, but if you have any questions at the end, we are more than happy to answer them. Um, so again, uh, we're with the Pennsylvania Integrated Pest Management Program, which is an autonomous statewide program. We are housed at Penn State in the Department of Entomology, and we are funded by competitive grants. Um, again, we are part of Penn State, a top 20 rated a top 20 rated research institution and part of the National Land Grant University System. Our information is uh, unbiased, researched, and science-based. And as a disclaimer, our um, products, vendors, or commercial services mentioned or pictured in this presentation are for illustrative purposes only and are not meant to be endorsements. Any medical concerns must be addressed by a medical professional and do not take legal action based on this presentation. Please consult with a lawyer. All right. so. What is a pest? A pest is a living thing in a place where we don't want it. It could be a mammal, it could be an insect, it could be a virus, it could be a plant. Um, pests spread diseases to people, they can um, also to plants and animals, they can destroy property and uh, oftentimes they're a nuisance. So these are just some of the examples of things that might be a pest to you. Um, you know, we could have a very lively discussion on on perhaps why uh, bats or cats or raccoons are on this list. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to everything, but it's, you know, again, a pest is where we don't want it. So what are some of the problems that are caused by pests? Well, first of all, they're unpleasant, right? There are also stigmas associated with having pests, and oftentimes those aren't true. Um, you could have the cleanest house and still have an occasional pest problem. Um, but pests can damage property. They can chew, like mice, rodents, rats, can chew through wires and cause fires. Termites can cause structural uh, damage to homes. Um, pests can also be associated with health problems. So they can bite or sting, spread bacterial and viral diseases, contaminate food, and trigger asthma. So um, Diane and I are both in Philadelphia. Uh, even though we work for Penn State, we are housed in the county extension office here in Philadelphia. And Cockroaches and mice are triggers of asthma, um, and that is a, is a major issue for school-aged children in the city, and in lots of cities, not just Philadelphia. Um, so what is the knee-jerk reaction oftentimes for a pest? Well, a lot of people reach for a can of pesticide. And if we think about the word pesticide, you know, what is a pesticide? If you look at it, the, the ending of the word there, the suffix side, uh, means to kill, so to kill a pest. Um, and these chemicals are made on purpose to be harmful to life in some way. They might interfere with nerve or muscle function. They might be stomach poisons. They might thin the blood, but there are other mechanisms that uh, are in them to make them kill a pest. So here are a few examples. So an insecticide kills insects, rodenticide kills, kills rodents. You kind of get the picture, but the pesticide is the big word that we use to cover all of these different types of pesticides. And what are the problems with pesticides? Well, for starters, people don't often read the label and the label includes instructions that you should actually take note of before you purchase it um, and before you use it and then before you dispose of it. Uh, just because something's for sale doesn't necessarily make it, make it safe. 
So the label is a law and you're supposed to read it and follow all of these instructions for use, storage and disposal. Again, pesticides are made to harm living things and often we don't fully understand the pros and the cons of, of the way they work. Um, and they can have an impact on human health, especially children. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are, if we choose to use a pesticide, that we're using one that is the least toxic or most effect and most effective for the problem that we are um, trying to solve. Um, but this is not the only thing that we should be doing. So integrated pest management is, is where we would like to focus today. So IPM, integrated pest management, is common sense practices to eliminate the reasons pests come into our spaces. So eliminating food, water, and shelter. We all need these things to survive and so do pests. Uh, integrated pest management is economical, effective, and uh, pays attention to the health and environmental sensitive um, areas. It's systematic and scientific approach to pest management. So when you use IPM, you understand the pest's identity and habits. You use non-toxic preventative measures first. You use multiple tactics. And if needed, again, you choose the least risky chemicals. So how do we do this? Well, pests are a problem. Pesticides can be a problem. Um, so we, we want to focus on three things. We want to prevent pests, we want to keep watch, and we want to eliminate them. Um, it's kind of like a three-legged stool. And if you remove one of those legs, then the pests are likely go, to go away. And if you remove two of them, even greater chance. Okay. Keep in mind that routine monthly spraying is not part of an IPM program. You're not actually solving the problem. You're just harvesting the pest. <laughs> um, yeah, on a monthly basis. So if, if you're not getting rid of the food or the water or shelter and you're just spraying a pesticide, you're not actually solving the problem. So we want to focus on IPM today. And this is the IPM pyramid of tactics. You can think of it um, kind of like the old food pyramid, if you're old enough to remember that, um, where you stay at the bottom of the pyramid and you work your way up. When you do that, the bottom of the period pyramid focuses on preventative tactics. And as you move up, you get to intervention. You also increase toxicity. So we want to focus on things um, that are in the bottom drawer of this toolbox here of this pyramid, uh, cultural design and maintenance. So things like um, sanitation and changing behaviors. Um, but physical mechanical things can also be used, things like traps and screens, um, you know, which are really handy right now for mosquitoes. Uh, sealing up um, cracks and crevices with uh, caulk and repairing leaks. Um, in different situations, you can use biological controls for um, like parasitic uh, nematodes. And again, at the very top of the pyramid are the ones that are the um, more intervention and more toxic. And see, so this is the chemicals. And not all chemicals are created the same. Some are just less risky because of what's in them or how we apply them. Um, so the less risky chemicals include things like boric acid, repellents, insect growth regulators, and then the ones that are more risky are things that kill on contact, um, you know, concentrates, antimicrobial disinfectants, loose baits, and those are things we would prefer to stay away from. And if we want to take a look at pesticides a little mm -hmm. bit more, those two top parts of the triangle, um, all pesticides contain a signal word. And it's usually on the front of the package and it says caution, warning, danger, or danger poison. And those words actually mean something in terms of um, how, how risky they are, how hazardous they are. Um, and they are related to a test known as the LD50, the lethal dose at which 50% of the test population dies. Um, it's usually done on rats and rabbits and it's equated to a 150 pound male. Um, there are oral doses or dermal doses like, um, you know, that you would absorb through your skin or inhalation that you would breathe in. Um, but it's important to take note of these signal words. So if you are going to use a pesticide, you should stay with something that says caution. Avoid things above that warning danger or danger poison. Most of the ones that are danger poison are actually not available to, um, to residents. Uh, you have to be a licensed pest control operator, a, a licensed pest, pesticide applicator in order to um, purchase them, but just take note of those signal words. And we recommend against using home rep remedies. 
For starters, there's no label. We don't understand the human risks. We're not sure about what personal protection you should be using. There are no directions for the mix or the solution, how to use it, dispose it, how to store it. Um, and oftentimes these products are not designed for or intended for or tested for pest control. So their impacts are unknown. And there may be uh, some impacts, not just on the pests that you're trying to get rid of, but also on pets and birds, aquatics. And you know this might be one of those things where the cure, which is your homemade remedy, is worse than the disease, which is the pest. So, you know, oftentimes there's things that we read online. Um, I like to refer to that as internet science. So there are some common internet science sites out there that will say, you know, oh, Dawn dish detergent, you know, if you put it in your water and you spray your plants, it'll get rid of um, your aphids. But as it turns out, Dawn dish detergent can actually burn the plant's leaves. It can impact the soil quality and it can kill non-targets such as pollinators. So avoid the use of home remedies for your safety, for the safety of non-targets, and then for just overall environmental health. Um, just to wrap it up, we do have some IPM resources which are available on our website. Um, and our website is here. This is how you can reach me if you need to. Um, and then you can also check out our website. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Diane to um, give a little more detail. You're muted still. Did this in the wrong order. I'm sorry, friends. Okay. I think we're ready now. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, that was very great, and I'm going to spend the rest of our time pretty much talking about bed bugs because bed bugs are interesting as well as being gross, and because they are kind, they're sort of the exception to a lot of the way that we do IPM. Uh, I'm not going to repeat the disclaimers from Michelle. Okay, so what are bed bugs? Bed bugs are really tiny insects. But contrary to popular belief, you can see them. A newborn bed bug is going to be really, really tiny, about the size of a poppy seed on a bagel. <clears throat> but a full-grown bed bug is going to be about the size of a sesame seed. And if it's fully fed, it can be as big as an apple seed. And I don't know if you can see it very well, but these are actual bed bugs. Okay. And um, as Hannah said, bed bugs have not been shown to spread diseases. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, later on. They can't fly or jump. All they can do is crawl, but they're pretty good at that. They can do several miles an hour. Uh, if you're trying to, if you spot a bed bug and try to catch it, you'd be surprised at how fast it can move. Uh, the good news is that bed bugs can be controlled uh, with heat or with biopesticides, but most conventional pesticides are not going to give you effective control. Uh, as, and that includes most liquid or aerosol pesticides that you can buy over the counter in your local hardware store or home uh, big box store. Um, it may say bed bugs on the label, but that doesn't mean it's gonna kill them because the bed bugs are, have, are quickly developing resistance to everything that we use against them. So it's important to understand how, what the bed bug life cycle is. Um, so we start with the egg. Uh, here we have a little egg. And this egg is really, really tiny. It's only about a millimeter long, which is a 26th of an inch. And they're sticky. And the female lays them in cracks and crevices or along the edge of the mattress piping or places like that. And it takes about, uh, 
six to 10 days for that egg to hatch. And out of that comes this little baby bed bug that we call the nymph. And this guy, like I said, is probably about the size of a poppy seed and translucent. Really, really hard to see. In fact, you're probably not going to see them. Um, and this nymph has to get a blood meal because it comes out of the egg, has no food. The only thing bed bugs eat is our blood. That's its food, that's its water. So it has to feed and it has to do it relatively quickly. If it doesn't get food, uh, get to a host sometime in the first couple of days, it's probably gonna starve to death. Good news for us. However, once it gets a blood meal, it can start to grow and it will shed its exoskeleton, colloquially call it a skin, okay? It can shed its skin and it, start, and it gets to be a, a larger uh, nymph. And again, this nymph must have a blood meal before it continue to grow. And this happens a total of five times, one, two, three, four, five, before it finally becomes an adult. And these darker bugs have been partially fed, whereas this uh, male bed bug here is fully fed. How do I know it's a male? Because it has a pointy butt. Female bed bugs have a much more rounded um, abdomen, as you'll see. Now, one of the things about this is that uh, that, pro that uh, growth process takes at least 30 days and probably closer to 60 in field conditions. And it may be slower than that. If uh, it's very cold or if people go away on a vacation uh, and there is no, feed, no host to feed on, um, that may slow down. And so it's going to take a while before you realize that you have a bed bug problem because originally you have very, very, very few bugs and they're really, really, really small. About 70% of all bed bugs in the population are gonna be juveniles. So it really takes time to build up an, enough bugs that are big enough to see uh, in practicality for you to realize you have a problem. So most of the infestations that uh, that we see have been around at least three months, probably six months before people even realize they have a problem. And that's part of the problem because by the time you notice it, you already have a pretty severe infestation. So how do you get bed bugs? Because you're unlucky. Uh, bed bugs actually have nothing to do with sanitation. Cockroaches, yeah, you've got to have food for them and your know, crumbs, garbage, whatever. Not with bed bugs because you are their dinner, okay? So it's sanitation does, has really nothing to do with it. And I don't know anybody that wants bed bugs. So it's not like people are going out and trying to find bed bugs. No, the bed bugs find us, okay? Um, most important method of, method of transfer is hitchhiking. They climb on our clothes, our backpacks, our shoes, whatever, and they follow us home. Uh, where They transfer from person to person in places where there's crowding and transients. So public transit, uh, apartment blocks, group homes, and any place where people sit for long periods of time. That could include movie theaters, it could include dialysis, it could include waiting rooms. Um, Fortunately, in general, offices and schools are not good environments for bed bugs, and we don't tend to see them very often. However, uh, in the early part of the epidemic, in the early 2000s, uh, mattr used mattresses were a major source of transfer. People would get bed bugs, they'd throw their mattress out, somebody else would come along and say, oh, look, a mattress on the street, take it home, and now they've got bed bugs. Nowadays, I don't know anybody that'd pick a mattress up off the street. If you're thinking about it, don't do it. So how and why bed bugs spread? Well, we talked about hitchhiking. Here's a fun topic, sex, bed bug sex. There's not ours. <clears throat> and here you can see, this is the female bed bug and notice, notice a much more rounded bottom than that male that we looked at earlier. And this is the male mounting her, not in the normal expected position. He's actually poking a hole in her, in her abdomen. 
Uh, it's called traumatic insemination and it hurts and it damages the bed bug. And if she is mated too many times, it can actually kill her. So as soon as she is mated, she likes to, to book out of there and find a place where there are no other males uh, who are gonna bother her. And she can start a new colony, uh, heal, her, heal and lay her eggs. And so this pioneering is a major reason for bed bug dispersal. And unfortunately, it also means that a lot of the individual bed bugs that you and I might pick up from, say, a septa bus or a movie theater, um, are may very well be mated females. And it just takes one to start an infestation. Uh, one of the other reasons why bed bugs persist and spread is the use of over-the-counter chemicals, things that you buy at the grocery store, or the home store, or the hardware store. Um, Almost all of the chemicals available to uh, residents are what are, are in a ca class called pyrethroids. And at this point, between 85 and 95% of all bed bugs are resistant to that chemical. Um, and they are rapidly developing resistance to other chemicals that we are using against them. So we really don't recommend the use of over the counter chemicals. Uh, they're not actually going to kill the bugs. What they tend to do is uh, cause, repel them and cause them to disperse. So if you spray your apartment, uh, they're just gonna go through the walls and into your neighbors. We talked about used mattresses, but furniture also, bedside tables, dressers, other things may also be infested with bed bugs. Um, and so if people throw that furniture out and you take it home, you have new pets. Bed bugs may of course be brought in by visitors to your home. Um, they may even be brought in by aides or other staff. Uh, but uh, the good news is that reports have been stable for about 10 years now. In the early 2000s, bed bug cases were doubling every year. And then about 2011, they hit a plateau. And they've been pretty constant since then. They haven't gone up. They haven't gone down very much either. Um, one of our colleagues, Dr. Michael Levy at University of Pennsylvania did a door-to-door -door survey in South Philadelphia uh, and found that 11.2% of South Philadelphia residents had had bed bugs in the previous five years. And that's consistent with very limited other data that we have, but we think that about 10% of Philadelphians are going to have bed bugs over a five-year period which is a lot of people. So just some pretty pictures. Um, okay, so down here in the bottom center, we have those bed bug eggs and you can see how thin they are. This is the fabric on a mattress uh, case. Okay, so these eggs are about the same thickness as the threads in the mattress casing. These eggs have all hatched. You notice the end is open. Um, here we have an adult bed bug feeding, probably a male, it looks like. And, you know, uh, bed bugs feed on blood. And when they start to fill up, their last meal has to go somewhere. So they poop out this little pellet of digested blood. And it lands on the skin or the pajamas or the bedding and causes this lovely fecal staining. It's euphemistically called rust stains, but it is poop. Um, and unlike most insect frass, uh, which is what we tend to call insect feces, um, this is not a, a particle or a pellet, it's liquid. Uh, so these stains look like Sharpie smear. Uh, you don't, they don't look like coffee grains, like cockroach poop, for instance. Um, and here we have a bunch, whole bunch of bed bugs along that piping along the top edge of the mattress. Uh, we have some adults here and we have some nymphs or some sub-adults. Um, and there might even be an egg or two in there. I can't, my screeny thing may be covering it. Um, and bed bugs are, are, like to hang out together. They're not true social insects like bees or ants, but they do like to hang with each other just like cockroaches do. And as they shed their exoskeletons, their skins, um, these cast skins uh, accumulate. And for instance, in the 
bed frame, uh, that metal L-shaped bracket that frequently your box spring sits in, in on your bed frame, uh, in a large infestation, you'll get an accumulation of what appears to be sand in that bed frame. And that sand is actually these cast skins. And if you look at it with magnifying glass, you can see that. Uh, here we have another, more aggregations. These are subadults, more there. Here we have bed bugs of all ages uh, hanging out right between the box spring and the mattress. And it turns out that the box spring is the favorite place for cockroaches to hang. Uh, there's lots of space in there. It's protected. There's a lot of habitat between wooden framing and cotton padding and metal struts. Bed bugs like to be in th between things. And so, in fact, when they turned that box spring over, you can see all the fecal staining on the underside of the box spring. Truly attractive. Uh, I mentioned that uh, schools and offices are not great places for bed bugs. That's because uh, they're just, it's not an environment where people tend to be sleeping and there's too much motion and activity in general. So bed bugs can be introduced any place and are regularly uh, in schools, offices, particularly um, think places like social service agencies or public agencies that have a lot of visitors. Bed bugs will be introduced, but you've got to remember that for a colony to form, that bed bug, first of all, has to be a, a mated female, and then she has to be able to lay her eggs. The eggs have to hatch successfully. Then the nymphs have to find a host and feed all the way through all the site, uh, through the entire uh, growth cycle before you are finally going to have adults who can uh, mate and create a colony. And that's going to take, as I said, the minimum of 60 days for the first generation and probably close to three months before you have a real infestation with a breeding colony. So it's, they're just not good places. Uh, but there, of course, there are exceptions. If you have uh, young children in uh, childcare, for instance, uh, nap, uh, naps, um, uh, the cots that they use for naps or cozy corners with lots of cushions and maybe a tent-like area. Uh, cribs in infant rooms, unfortunately, need to be turned over and inspected carefully. Uh, special education uh, areas can also have problems, particularly if students are in wheelchairs because wheelchairs can become infested and then they can become distribution devices. In uh, child care and schools, cubbies and, and in uh, business and industry, cubbies and lockers can become infested if people are bringing them at home, from home. Similarly, staff lounges or break rooms. Um, and in rare cases, individual cubicles or offices, uh, with people who may have them at home and have not realized it. Um, but they tend not to spread very widely um, in schools or offices. But of course, if you look at the literature, you will find exceptions. So if you're concerned about uh, visiting people who might have bed bugs, um, avoid sitting on couches, beds, or uh, stuffed chairs or other uh, upholstered furniture. Uh, sit on hard chairs, kitchen chairs, uh, things like that. Um, if you are a social service, uh, person who does home visiting, you might want to bring your own folding stool. Um, light colored clothing is easier to see the bugs on. And uh, in some cases, you may want to bring wear booties over your feet. And if you do this for a living, you might want to have an extra set of clothes in a Ziploc bag uh, so that you can do one of those quick wiggle changes and clothes if you need to. And if you suspect bed bugs, only take in what is absolutely necessary and never ever set anything on beds, upholstered furniture or the floor. If you work in, for instance, in a social service agency where you might have uh, a lot of visitors, you wanna do things like keep clutter down so that it makes it easier to see uh, what's going on. Uh, caulk cracks and crevices, for instance, around intake counters uh, where people um, might be coming. Use plastic or metal client seating that's got no cracks or crevices and is easy to inspect. 
You can also put barriers on the foot of your desks. Um, these are called interceptors. And this brand is called Climb Up, which was the first available and is widely used. And it's very simple. It's just got these barriers and bed bugs can't really climb smooth surfaces. And so they get stuck inside. And so here you can see how effective they are at catching things. There's other products out there. Um, there's a product called a volcano, which is also a pitfall trap. The bugs crawl up the outside and fall into the inside. Whoops, come back here, sorry. Um, and these are, these are very, uh, I, I prefer these for office use because they, they're much more discreet. You can put them in a, back under your desk or in the corner of a cubicle and people won't even notice them. For treatment for bed bugs, um, and with integrated pest management, we always start with non-chemical treatments. And so there are, vac you can use a vacuum cleaner. There are HEPA vacuums, or you can just use a regular vacuum cleaner if you use a, uh, a filter in the tube to prevent the bed bugs from getting up. And if you want to learn how to do that, please contact me. Um, we also use steam to kill bed bugs. It cooks them. And it's great because it not only kills the bugs, but it kills the eggs because hard boiled eggs don't hatch. Uh, we can also use clothes dryers. Just if you put anything that you can into a hot clothes dryer for half an hour, that will kill any bugs and any eggs. And then there are things called hot boxes, which are similar to the a product similar to these. Uh, they come in various sizes, ranging from a small one about the size of a suitcase like this to tents that you can set up in somebody's living room that are about eight feet long and four feet deep and six feet high. Um, and these are extremely effective. Uh, heat kills all bugs at all life stages. You just need to get things hot enough uh, for long enough. And that's why a box is a good solution because it retains and concentrates the heat. If you're looking at chemical treatments, you really want to have a uh, pest management professional uh, do the applications. As I said, the chemicals that are available to residents over the counter really are not effective. You're simply going to prolong your problem and make your, make your misery last longer. Um, things that uh, pest management professionals might use include various dust products such as diatomaceous earth or DE, silica gels or a particular uh, synthetic a uh, dust called Cymexa, which is extremely effective against bed bugs. And you may notice here, I'm actually mentioning brand names and I'm not supposed to do that. But you know, the thing is bed bugs are a real problem. They don't follow a lot of your classic IPM. We can't get rid of the food and water because the food and water is us. Okay, so in the last 10 years or so, some really specific products have been developed targeted at bed bugs. And they are so superior to anything else that is available that we have to recommend them. Um, that includes those interceptors. That includes uh, some of these products, the dusts, uh, and another product I'm gonna talk about in a minute here. Um, some pest management professionals may use uh, liquids and aerosols especially to get into very difficult to access areas. Um, but those are going to have a limited use and they're going to be carefully chosen. And those are not products that are generally available to residents. So don't go thinking that you can use a can of Raid to spray bed bugs. And finally, recently uh, in the last few years, there's been a new product that's a biopesticide that's been developed. It's called Apprehend and it is consists of uh, spores of a fungus that infect bed bugs and they only infect, excuse me, bugs. They do not infect people or other mammals, birds, fish, amphibians. It strictly affects insects and it's been tested uh, for efficacy and it's been tested for safety by the EPA. Um, and it's, a one, it's an amazing product. Uh, it's used very differently and it can be used in difficult and cluttered environments and be effective. Um, basically all a bed bug has to do is crawl across it and that bug is going to die in about three to five days. 
meanwhile, because the bed bugs like to hang out together, the bug is actually transferring those fungus, that fungus spore to other bed bugs in the aggregation. And so it'll take out the entire colony in about a three week time. And it does have a three month residual period of activity. So it's very effective for taking down colonies and for preventing reinfestation. Uh, Michelle showed uh, some resources earlier. I did want to say that we recently updated our very comprehensive manual on IPM, which includes chapters on everything, including, uh, including bed bugs, but not including policy and designing IPM programs and read, letting out IPM contracts. And then it goes through uh, all sorts of bugs from ants to yellow jackets. Um, and with and even uh, other pe pests, including turf pests. Um, and <laughs> you can get a free download of it if you go to the link that's on here. And that's my contact information. And I'd love to have some questions if anybody had some. That was great. Thank you both so much. Um, I know I learned a lot. Um, I have worked with the IPM team for a while now, but I still, that was mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, I definitely learned a lot. Thank you both so much. And we do have a couple of questions um, from Carlos. And do we want to keep recording or stop at this point? Go either way. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording.